Rainbow Six Siege has come a long way from those live action commercials with Idris Elba, as awesome as they were. With year 4 complete and 52 operators deep, Ubisoft has given us plenty to talk about. I'm Kyle with the leaderboard and this is 107 facts about Rainbow Six Siege Volume 2. For these facts, we're looking at gameplay, lore, inspirations, designs, and more, so strap in. Also make sure you subscribe to the leaderboard. Both in-game and IRL, Rainbow Six Siege's team is as strong as ever. As of January 2020, Rainbow Six Siege has surpassed 55 million players. Number two, Siege currently has 52 operators from around the globe, 53 if you count recruit, and there's another 48 promised operators on the way, but they've also said they're not planning on stopping there, if the fan base will allow them. Number three, Rainbow Six Siege's latest operation, Shifting Tides, brought us Kali, founder of Nighthaven. When designing her look, the team at Ubisoft made sure all of her gear looked professional, military grade, and expensive, not homemade. Number four, and if you look at Kelly's right shoulder, you'll see a scar from a bullet wound that pierced her on a mission. Number five, we also got Kelly's right hand man from Kenya, Wamai. In his early designs, Wamai's magnet system would simply capture grenades and then you could retrieve them, but Ubisoft realized that players would typically get killed going for the ordnance. Number six, Wamai's hobby is free diving. He spent his childhood hunting sharks and collecting lost treasures off the ocean floor. No big deal anything, this guy just living his best life. He's also performed numerous record-breaking free dives due to his ability to hold his breath for long periods of time. Number seven, this extreme lung capacity seems to help Wamai in and out of the water as well. Official concept art of Wamai shows him barely breaking a sweat while Olympic hopeful Valkyrie struggles to keep up. Number eight, Operation Shifting Tides reintroduced Map Theme Park, which first showed up in Operation Blood Orchid. Ubisoft reworked it so it's a bit more balanced. The lighting is different in certain spots, like the haunted house area on the first floor, the trains have been removed and reworked, and the map feels different but similar to players. Number nine, Streamer Bikini Body started a campaign to get the ACOG on the Boshki shotgun, and it worked. With Operation Shifting Tides, Bikini and the Siege community got their wish. Number 10, Rainbow Six's latest event, Road to SI, or Six Invitational, has introduced a bunch of new things to the game, including a new map called Stadium, a Battle Pass, and a new CGI trailer, The Program. Number 11, Stadium is like a mix of Oregon and the old Hereford base smashed into one. For example, there is the classroom, staircase, and kid's bedroom from Oregon, and the garage and other side rooms from Hereford base. It's also the first map to include bulletproof glass walls, adding a bit more of a mental game to your gunfights. Number 12, Rainbow Six Siege's battle passes like other battle passes. There's a free and a premium track, but compared to other battle passes, the premium track gives more rewards and only has 35 tiers to grind through. Number 13, the free battle pass sports rewards like two two headpieces for Cavera and Sledge, weapon charms, a skin for Valkyrie's MPX, and a couple of alpha packs as well. Number 14, the premium pass is 1200 R6 credits, or $10 USD, and gives you a bunch of stuff right off the bat. There's the Sledge Light Pack, which has an outfit, weapon skin, and charm for Sledge. You'll also get cosmetics like sports outfits for operators like Hibana, Cavera, Mozzie, Blitz, Thermite, and others. But wait, there's more! The Premium Pass also nabs you weapon skins, charms, alpha packs, and 600 R6 credits. Number 15, Valkyrie's design is heavily inspired by Kinesa Johnson, a real army vet who now works as a technical advisor for anti-poaching rangers in Africa. Kinesa and a pocket of the internet had been suspicious that Valkyrie was based on her, but Ubisoft finally confirmed it in an interview. Number 16, Valkyrie has a small cameo in Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands during Operation Archangel. This Ubisoft crossover features Kavera heading to Bolivia to save her brother while Nomad, that is Wildlands Nomad, not the Operator Nomad, teams up with Twitch and Valkyrie to wrangle Cav in before she gets herself killed. Number 17, Cav actually has a ton of older brothers. She was the seventh born in a family of 10 boys. But in Archangel, Kavira gets to be the big sister and save her little brother. It's actually really sweet that she would torture and murder all those cartel members to save him. Number 18, to make Cav more accurate, Ubisoft watched documentaries on Bope interrogation techniques including waterboarding, beating a bucket placed over your head, and the signature knife to the throat intimidation technique. But I think we can all agree it would be a lot more fun if Cav's gadget was a bucket that she carried around and just beat your head with it. It'd be silly, but like, effective. 
Number 19. Cav's not the only operator who has siblings either. Bandit actually has a twin brother. Don't expect any kind of twin team up though, his brother chose a civilian life after an accident with Bandit's crude electrical device. He decided to settle down and have kids instead. At least Bandit enjoys getting to be the fun uncle though. Number 20. Everyone knows Ella and Sophia's sister rivalry, but Twitch has an academic rivalry with her sister, who's a physicist. The difference is, is they actually like each other. Apparently, Twitch's father always told his daughters, strive to be incredible every day and it will resonate out into the universe, which is just top-notch fathering. Number 21. Speaking of sister rivalry, if you're playing Ella or Sophia in a match and you kill your sister operator, you will get a sister rivalry bonus. Number 22. Twitch is the first female member of the GIGN. In our world, there has never been a female member of the GIGN, but Ubisoft decided that representation was more important than accuracy. Besides, these organizations are full of secrets. Maybe they just don't want to tell us about their badass French ladies. Number 23. Thick Boy Montagna, or Monty, is based off a real GIGN officer. During a 1994 hostage situation, this officer took grenade blasts and shotgun shells to the chest without backing down and without a shield. And that is why you pick up those plates, kids. Number 24. In fact, several operators are inspired by real-world events, but not all of them are glorious. Fuse is inspired by an incident where a counter-terrorist unit used knockout gas in an attempt to save a large group of hostages being held in a theater. Unfortunately, the gas had only been tested in outdoor areas before and proved fatal to some when concentrated in the confined space. This led developers to create a gadget that was deadly when used indoors, but could also be dangerous to allies if used poorly. Number 25. The inspiration behind Glaz is the hero of the Soviet Union, Vasily Zaitsev, a Soviet sniper during World War II. Zaitsev's military career has been the subject of several books and films, and his tactics are still used to this day. But I think we can all agree that his crowning achievement is being nearly reincarnated in a video game character. Number 26. Sledge was inspired by a real SAS operative in the 1980s siege of the Iranian embassy in London. Many had tried to break in, but the very first operator to get in was wielding this huge hammer. Number 27. The assault known as Operation Nimrod is canonically part of Thatcher's military record. On Thatcher's elite skin, he's shown wearing a medal he received from the mission from none other than the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Number 28. And yes, just in case you were wondering, Ubisoft has confirmed that the operator, Thatcher, is named named after the same Margaret Thatcher. Number 29. There's actually a real photo of Margaret Thatcher posing with three SAS operatives after the siege of the Iranian embassy. In siege canon though, Thatcher is that guy in the middle. Number 30. Multiple operators are based off movie stars and action heroes. For example, Pulse is based off Bruce Willis in the Die Hard series. Number 31. The toothpick in Legion's mouth draws inspiration from Chow Young Fat. The action star would also often have a toothpick or matchstick in his mouth during his movies. Number 32. IQ and her personality are based off Charlie Starling, Jodie Foster's character in Silence of the Lambs. Number 33. According to presentation director Alex Karpazitz, Mozzie's character is based off Robert Carlyle from Train Spotting. But if you look at Mozzie with his helmet off, I'd say he kind of looks like him too. Number 34. In Gridlock's design, as well as most of Operation Burn Horizon, is actually an homage to Mad Max. Gridlock's last name, Ferris, is an anagram of Mad Max Fury Rose Furiosa. Number 35. Gridlock is a mechanic in the eldest of five, which makes her one sibling off from being able to recreate Furiosa's runaway bride crew. Maybe Mozzie can dress up for the part. Number 36. Mozzie and Gridlock met in high school at the inaugural Robot Wars in Australia. They were against each other at first, but Mozzie's bot stopped working, so he he went to Gridlock for repairs. Since Gridlock has a soft spot for underdogs, she took pity on the little man. Mozzie won the competition and they became fast friends, but Gridlock will never tell him she had the remote in her pocket the whole time. Number 37. I don't have a lot in common with these operators, but one thing Mozzie and I have in common is we're both middle siblings. According to Harry, this explains Mozzie's showman side and why he feels the need to put extra effort into being noticed and heard. And that also probably explains why I felt the need to be on a YouTube channel. Number 38. Harry's not an operator, but he's still a very important character in Rainbow Six Siege. Dr. Harishva Harry Pandey is the new head of Rainbow, aka Six. He was properly introduced in February 17, 2019 in the mind-blowing cinematic The Hammer and the Scalpel. But Harry has actually been around since the beginning. Number 39. Harry can be seen, or rather read, signing off on psychological reports for Rainbow's original operators like Rook, Ash, and Tachanka. 
Number 40. We know about Harry's knife-hating wife, but in Blitz's report, we find out that Harry has a son as well. Number 41. Mozzie is definitely a daredevil, but he's also big on being a family man as well. Mozzie joined Rainbow on the condition that he'd get enough time to be there for his wife and their expected twins. Number 42. Mozzie's not the only parent in Siege, though. Zofia is the first mother in Rainbow. One of the Ubisoft developers was pregnant, and the writer thought it was, quote, a super interesting element to explore. Number 43. Zofia doesn't really trust anyone. Not since she was a child and three of her classmates took turns trying to drown her just for fun. Bullying scars run deep, y'all. She keeps her distance from everyone, even her squad mates. She does care about her sister Ella, but Ella keeps Zofia at a distance. Number 44. In Zofia's initial design, instead of using her signature KS-79 lifeline, Zofia threw her explosives by hand. The developers felt this lacked personality, so they gave Zofia her grenade launcher. Number 45. Maestro's initial designs had him placing an automated turret. Plenty of other games have characters with auto turrets, but internal tests proved this wasn't interesting in Siege's gameplay. Although, it makes Maestro's name make a lot more sense when you think about it. Number 46. When Maestro was first revealed on livestream, he didn't have his iconic cigar, but a piece of grain like a farmer. This was probably changed for rating. No tobacco in my FPS shooter tournament broadcast, no sir. Number 47. Maestro's profile picture has the largest smile, but Dogby was the first operator to smile in her portrait. She was the 35th operator, by the way. Number 48. Dogby is named for the nature deities or spirits of Korean folklore. Dogby are often depicted wearing traditional Korean dress and interacting with humans by possessing inanimate objects. Sometimes they help lost travelers, and other times they just play tricks on them. Number 49. Echo's drone Yokai gets its name from Japanese folklore. Yokai are a class of supernatural demons ranging from malevolent to mischievous. They also have the ability to shapeshift. Number 50. Plenty of people consider Echo to be Dokubi's counter, but the two of them are actually on pretty friendly terms. Still, things apparently get pretty competitive when they're trying to outdo each other in the workshop. Number 51. Dokubi's real name is Grace, which she got because her parents named her after actress Grace Kelly. Number 52. Grace's gadget icon is supposed to be a Dokubi. It's the first operator icon that is related to the character instead of the gadget itself. Number 53. While Dokubi pretends to have bad vision, Capitao actually has impaired vision, making him the first operator with a disability. Number 54. During development, Ubisoft had issues determining how much gray to put in Capitao's hair. He's 49 years old, so too much gray would make him look like he belonged in a retirement home, and at the same time, too little gray wouldn't give him the look of an experienced operator. Number 55. Capitao is getting up there, but Kaid is the oldest operator, at 58 years old and he's just two years older than Thatcher. Number 56. Meanwhile, Mute is the youngest operator in Rainbow at 25, though that doesn't mean he's any less capable. Being part of the SAS is impressive enough, but he's also one of the youngest students to be accepted into Cambridge University. Number 57. Back to the legit oldest op, Kaid's design came from Ubisoft, quote, wanting someone who exudes strength, but also had a bit of a gut. Enter the commander. Number 58. Kaid's gadget was always intended to protect hatches, but before it switched to electricity, it originally had a jammer effect like mute signal disruptors. Number 59. The design of Kaid's Electro Claw is based on the Moroccan Flick Flack Spider, a real breed of spiders indigenous to the deserts of Morocco that escapes predators by doing cartwheels. Number 60. Kaid has a ceremonial knife on his belt that was given to him by the previous commander of the fortress, a tradition that goes back generations. Number 61. On the map Fortress, there is a hall you can find that has portraits and the knives of the previous commanders. Following the line, you can find Kaid's portrait and an empty display case that will eventually hold his dagger. Number 62. Kaid means commander in Moroccan Arabic, but his real name, Jalal al Fasi, is actually a nod to one of the tech guys at Ubisoft, who is Moroccan and shares the same name. Number 63. Lion's backstory is based on the real life of a French producer who grew up in a very strict household, attended military academy, and then dropped everything to become a video game producer. That last part may not match up with Lion's story, but who knows, the man's only 31, he's got time to change career paths. Number 64. The original idea for Lion's ability entailed smaller drones that would stick to surfaces and reveal enemies that walked within their range. Basically, it affected a smaller area compared to what Lion's drone could do on launch. Ultimately, this was scrapped, but maybe they'll try bringing it back in the future if they want to try giving wall hacks again. Might not be the best idea. Number 65. Instead, Lion has one drone flying high in the sky, the EE-1D. The team felt that this ability was much more balanced. 
balanced. But from such great heights, it's hard to tell how massive it is just by looking at it. Well, the drone actually has a diameter of four meters or just over 13 feet. Number 66. We all joke that Hibana's pellets look like fidget spinners, but they're actually based on motorcycle part Ubisoft Montreal's art director took off his bike while making repairs one afternoon. Number 67. When designing Hibana and Echo's uniforms, Ubisoft went for civilian clothing under harnesses so they could realistically reach the skyscraper map they launched with. Number 68. Unlike with other CTUs, Ubisoft had a tough time designing the uniforms for the Japanese SAT unit. There are very few photos to reference, and according to the Japanese government, it doesn't even exist. I mean, Delta Force doesn't technically exist either, but we still have Maverick. Number 69. For Maverick's design, since there is no official Delta Force uniform, Maverick's outfit features clothing from Afghanistan, including a Pakul, or Gilligiddy hat on his head. The wool hat owes its global celebrity to the Tajik majority members of the Jamaati Islami Afghanistan. In the 80s, Ahmad Shah Massoud led them against Soviet occupation, and he was known for wearing a Pakul. So, they adopted it as a standard item of their uniform. I'm also probably saying all these names wrong, and I apologize. I'm so sorry. Number 70. While in Afghanistan, Maverick played Buskashi. It's a horse-mounted sport where players attempt to place a goat or calf carcass in the goal. It's actually a big inspiration for Maverick's backstory, and before you say that Buskashi sounds too gruesome, think of American football where we toss around a pigskin. Number 71. Maverick loved Afghanistan so much he has a tattoo of the country's map on his forearm. Number 72. At one point, Maverick got captured during his time in the Middle East. He won't talk about what happened to him during that time, but we do know that he escaped with a blowtorch made from spare parts, and that was the prototype of what we see him now using in matches. Number 73. Maverick first came about when Ubisoft wanted a new hard breacher, but in Mav's initial design, he would launch small breaching devices at distances of up to 40 meters. With those, he could draw shapes, which was fun, but what sounds like essentially a more precise Ibana was deemed too powerful. So the developers leaned into what was fun about the character and reduced the range to what we know now. Number 74. Unbeknownst to Maverick, he actually owes his freedom to Danish operator Nook. Nook uncovered his location while she was deep undercover. Number 75. We don't actually know Nook's place of birth, date of birth, or real name. We just know she's from the Jaeger Corps of Denmark. NATO ordered Nook's identity to remain hidden to all but her fellow operators. All we know is she's the illegitimate daughter of someone she respects, and if her identity was ever released, it could potentially cause a public scandal. I'm thinking daughter of the Prime Minister of Denmark, perhaps? Number 76. Nook's veil gives her a sense of mystery and danger, but in early playtests when attackers would repel upside down, her veil would hang off her face. So, the development team went back in and attached her veil to her uniform. Number 77. While her life is a secret, Nook does have hobbies outside of military life and espionage. She's apparently a very skilled fencer. Number 78. Castle is referred to as Papa Bear among the Rainbow Operators. His easygoing manner has made him the social glue of the team, and he usually plays the role of diplomat in arguments. Number 79. See Ninja's operators have a ton of accomplishments and accolades, and yet none come close to when Castle rescued abused dogs. And this is my favorite fact in this whole list. Number 80. Amaru is another operator with a heart of gold. She helped raise a young Goyo after a bomb destroyed his home, killing his father and sister and severely injuring his mother. The blast left him with the C-shaped scar you can see on the side of his head. Number 81. Goyo's original canister was thrown, similar to Smoke's devices, but you still had to shoot them for them to work. Developers noted that they were either so big that enemy players could find them easily, or they were too small for teammates to spot. It felt like the canisters had too many moving parts to be effective, so they simply attached it to the back of a modified shield. Number 82. Goyo is an excellent chess player. Harry challenged him to a match when they first met, but won't mention how few moves it took for Goyo to win. Number 83. Amaro grew to be Goyo's cool aunt, who would tell him grand stories from her adventures stopping art traffickers in South America. So she's a kick-ass archaeologist who would tell folks, this belongs in a museum. So she's basically Siege's Indiana Jones. Number 84. Developing and balancing Amaru's Gara hook was rather tedious. The devs had to test it on every single ledge, window, and hatch in the game. Number 85. Internally, Amaru was known as the Attack on Titan operator, since her Gara hook worked like the 3D maneuver gear in the show. By the way, check out our sister channel, Get in the Robot, your anime explainer. Just saying.
number 86. Speaking of crazy flying blades, Finca's facial scar was from a CQB training exercise with Capcan. After he misstepped, Capcan sliced her face from brow to cheek. Still, Lyra went for a series of bone-breaking punches to his nose and his ribs before finally being overwhelmed by the pain. Her intense brawl with Capcan earned her the nickname Finca, which in Polish means knife. Number 87. Aside from Finca's face, Capcan probably leaves a lot of scars in general. His entry denial devices are actually nail bombs. I mean, those things always look like they hurt before, but like, huh. Number 88. Finca was born in the irradiated city of Gomel, Belarus, three years after the Chernobyl disaster. The radiation caused her to lose sensation in her extremities and caused her muscles to slowly degenerate. Nonetheless, Finca pushed back, becoming physically fit and studying microbiology and immunology to combat her neuropathy. Eventually, she earned a PhD and started treating herself with her own nanites while serving in the Russian army. Number 89. In development, Finca's nanites gave a crazy cocktail of buffs to her teammates. Ubisoft tried a speed boost that made Ash feel like a 5-speed operator, and making all opponents glow yellow like when looking through Glass's scope. Number 90. According to lead writer Lucian Solban, Finca and Tachanka are drinking buddies. The two of them can drink anyone under the table, especially with the help of Finca's nanites breaking down the alcohol, and I need a cinematic of this yesterday. Please, Ubisoft, I am begging you. Number 91. All non-microbiological related gadgets now get reviewed and tested by Mira, who is practically becoming Rainbow's version of Q. Mira can be seen and heard signing off on tests of Wamai's magnets, Nook's Hell device, Tachanka's turret shields, and more. The footage from her Garahook test, though, is still the best. Number 92. Mira's black mirrors were inspired by real-life military windshields that can be hydraulically ejected if they get too damaged to see through. Number 93. Nomad designed her air jabs after a trip to Kenya where she wanted to deter and push back the predatory wildlife without hurting them. Number 94. If you look closely, you might notice Nomad is missing the top digits of the middle and ring fingers on her right hand. She lost them to hypothermia on one of her voyages that went wrong. As a result, Nomad has some unique reload animations to make up for her lack of gripping power. Number 95. Nomad's initial designs gave her a frag grenade, but after designers enjoyed the knockback effect from the smashers in Siege's limited game mode Outbreak, they incorporated it into Nomad's ability. Number 96. The Outbreak event gave us one of our first chances to see Ash as the de facto leader of Rainbow, but Ubisoft has admitted that this wasn't intended during her development. When they noticed that the community kept placing her in leadership roles, they decided to make it canon. Number 97. Ash's device came from the desire to somehow fit a bazooka into Rainbow Six Siege. Now an out-and-out -out bazooka would be a little intense, so the team eventually scaled it down to the breaching rounds after consulting with their gadget realization expert. Number 98. Bandit's gadgets and story came from Ubisoft wanting to add a car battery that would electrify walls, but had a hard time justifying why top-notch operators would be using such a crude device. So, Bandit's undercover and criminal past were developed to fit such crude but effective means. Number 99. The entire GSG-9's design, in fact, was meant to give the impression that their operators were undercover agents. This explains the denim pants and IQ's iconic pink soles. Number 100. In some of Clash's early concept art, she had bright pink punk rock hair. It wouldn't have had the professional look she has now, but when you're a shield operator screaming at folks to piss off, you kind of stand out regardless. Besides, it's not like we haven't seen bright pink in Siege before. Cough, rainbow is magic. Cough. <clears throat> Number 100. 101. In early iterations, Clash's shield didn't just slow enemies, it completely stopped them in their tracks. Kind of like rooting enemies in MOBA-type games. This proved too deadly though, as standing still in Siege can often be a death sentence. And we've all played enough May in Overwatch to know what that would do to the player base. Number 102. Now we're all excited for new characters, but there's plenty more for Ubisoft to dive into with the characters they already have. For example, according to Farah Daoud Brixi of Ubisoft News, Alibi joined Rainbow with her own agenda that she can't share with anyone. Add in the femme fatale inspirations in her design and you have the makings of an exquisite rogue operator, or a snitch. Number 103. But even with everything changing, it's good to see the important things staying the same, like Theme Park's homage to Boston Bear Jew. The memorial to the late Siege player who passed away in early 2017 can still be found in the arcade. Number 104. Warden is from Kentucky, and he's been known to lean into his Kentucky drawl when dealing with Republican senators. He also plays the role of the Southern gentleman around women. 
Number 105. Pulse was the only operator in the original cast that didn't have any headgear. Which is silly until you think about how in early versions of Siege, accessories only made your hitbox bigger. Ironically, less protection helped your survivability. Number 106. When it comes to the playlist, Ubisoft has changed casual to quick play, added unranked, which is basically ranked without the ranking system, and also added the newcomer playlist. Number 107. The newcomer playlist is for new players to get a feel for Siege. Bomb is the only available game mode, and you can only play on three maps, Bank, Chalet, and Consulate. But don't get too comfortable, new players, as you can only play in this playlist until you turn level 50. And after that, Siege throws you to the wolves. So that's been another 107 facts about Rainbow Six Siege. What would you want the next 107 facts to be about? Let me know in the comments below, and I've been your host Kyle, and I'm glad you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to take a second to like and subscribe to the leaderboard. From indie to AAA, we love the games you play. Ha, <laughs> you play, which is also the app for Ubisoft games. Not intentional. Funny comparison.